Dear Judell, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for agreeing to do an interview for Male vs. Female Forum. It is an unbelievable opportunity and a great honor for all of us, your fans. Thank you. You were the pioneer of female submission wrestling scene, and many of the great submission wrestlers followed your track and were able to do what they did because of the path that you left for them. What was your motivation at the beginning? How did it all start? It started, probably, it really started uh, when I was growing up. Um, my father was quite athletic. He taught me to swim and different things like that. And I ended up having four brothers. So there was competition there, uh, two older and two younger. Would you wrestle with them at home? No. Oh. No, never did. Um, we all would pile on my dad, mm -hmm. and uh, when he'd come home and try to sleep on the couch before dinner, um, we always managed to get something going. But uh, no, I didn't wrestle with them. I didn't really do much wrestling until I started dating. And well, what do you mean by the fact that you were competitive with your brothers? Oh, we were competitive in anything we did, swimming especially. And if I could beat them, even if I had to cheat to beat them, racing or something or other, or swimming underwater, uh, I would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, just mainly because my dad would stand on the hill and watch us and have a twinkle in his eye whenever I beat them. Right. Now, so that may have been the, the start of the wrestling, um, but then I imagine we took a, a pause from that for a while, and then you um, started this up later in your life. Can you tell me how how it got started when you were in California? Well, when I was in California, uh, it basically, it was an interest of my husband's. And this is uh, Jack Dulong? Jack Dulong, yes. And um, he um, encouraged me to lift weights and to um, do a lot of running. We'd run um, on the weekends with the um, different groups that would be running. I was always very slow, but I was very strong. Mm -hmm. And I would lift weights every other day, and then I'd run, try to run five miles on the other days. And you just thought that this was because your husband was on a healthy campaign, or did you know what he was doing? Well, I didn't realize it at first that, that he was grooming me to become a wrestler. No, I didn't. But he started taking me around to different uh, groups that, that where women were wrestling, and I just automatically thought, well, yeah, no problem. And, you know, I could do that. I was raised with brothers and, and uh, did a lot of different sports activities. So, sure, that was just something else. So I did, didn't like boxing did, myself. Got you. But did he ever once pose the question to you? I mean, just directly uh, you know, put it on the table. Dear wife, I want you to wrestle. This is what I have envisioned for your future. Or was it just a nonchalant type of... Yeah, it was more than nonchalant. <laughs> he didn't come right out and say, hey, I want you to put on a bikini and, and fight with this girl. No. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I wasn't stupid. Okay, okay. Just making sure it wasn't just uh, completely out of the, uh, out of nowhere type of situation that you were in. Talk about being an obedient housewife, though, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed different activities and sports and and I had, um, you know, I was, I was doing pretty good with my running and building up my endurance and everything. Great. So um, now let's start back, back in the beginning, even before you were thought of or born. Um, please tell us a little bit about your German heritage. Is it true that your great grandfather immigrated to the USA in the 1860s? I believe so. And what was his name? Um, you said the great grandfather. Yeah, your great grandfather. Okay, I'm trying to, to go back in my head because, um, let's see, we had an Arthur Otto Metz. Okay. I believe, um, I don't think I really ever knew exactly when he came over. And, and so the family that immigrated to the U.S. from Germany, um, or, of, you know, German descent, were they on your mother's side or your father's side? My father's side. They were uh, actually from Metz, Germany. Oh, M-E-T-Z. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. And then your mother's side was she the Scanlans, was, and they yeah. were... Irish. Irish. Okay. Thank you. Um, you were born on August 16th, 1938, in Missoula, Montana, and were brought up in Polson, Montana. Is that correct? That's correct. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood years? 
Well, we moved from Missoula to Polson when I was about six. Oh, okay. And uh, my parents started out, they rented a house, and uh, my dad, being an electrician, uh, eventually owned an, an appliance store when I was I was quite young when he owned it. What what brought you guys from Missoula to Polson originally? Uh, my father's uncle um, had bought property, and my father inherited it, and so it was on the lake, on Flathead Lake. Nice. So yeah, unfortunately, he didn't buy the island. He could have bought. There was islands on the lake? <laughs> yes, there are islands on the lake, and he could have bought this one island for something like $100. So <laughs> now it's worth quite a little bit. Is it? Yeah, the lake is about 26 miles long, and it's freshwater, and it's about 15 miles wide. Jeez. And so swimming was the first sport I went into. Oh, awesome. So that's what started your, your road down this path, huh? <laughs> right, that and having brothers to compete with. Great. Well, that leads me to the next question. Um, do you think growing up with your four brothers is what made you competitive at sports? And, and if it was, did you wrestle at home? Who usually won? Um, growing up with four brothers just definitely made me competitive. And no, I did not wrestle. I remember my brothers, my older brothers, uh, trying to get me into a boxing match when I was about six. <laughs> they had the boxing gloves and uh, they had enlisted the little redheaded girl from across the alley to be my competitor. Oh, and she wasn't your ring gal, she was your competitor. She was my competitor. And how old were you at the time? I was six and she was five. Okay, so closely matched. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, she had red hair. <laughs> and so the, my brother's tying the gloves on us and we started out kind of hitting each other a little bit, but then we wanted to kill them, so. Right. It didn't last too long. So you long. ganged up on them? Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. So did you wrestle with your brothers at home, ever? No, I never did. Okay. They um, ignored me, my older brothers ignored me, and I had to babysit my younger brothers. So they were quite a bit bigger and older then? They were uh, two and three years older than me. And then? And um, yeah, I, I was a girl, you know. Right, so you were the middle child? I was the middle child, yes. Okay. And how old, uh, how much younger was your youngest brother? Um, my youngest brother is 10 years younger, and the other one was uh, eight or six years younger, I'm not sure. I see. I so a total of five siblings, correct? Yes. Great. Um, now, do you think that the experience of, of you having these brothers and you being competitive with them, did it have an effect on the future wrestling career? Do you think it played a little part into what you ended up doing? Yes, I think life? it did. I think it did because uh, I would compete with them with swimming and things like that. I was showing off right. for my dad. You know, I could do it better. Right. So that that drive, that, that nature was already in you. Right. That competitive edge. Right. I see. Well, thank you. What was your move from Montana to Garden Grove, California associated with? Work for my husband. Okay, so we're fast forwarding from you growing up on the lake as a child. Mm -hmm. um, you've now met your husband. You guys are, are already married or were yes, you not? Yes, we're married. Okay, and how old were you at the time that you moved to Garden Grove, California? Approximately. Oh, boy. Um, I was in my 30s, I think. Okay. okay. And so he moved there for work. What kind of work was he moving there for? He was um, a radio announcer. Oh, okay. And that's how we met. I wrote copy at the radio station that he was an announcer at. And where was this at, where you met uh, him? That was in Missoula, Montana. Interesting. Gotcha. I'd gone off to college for a year and changed my mind about things and came back and uh, ended up in Missoula working in a jewelry store. Uh-huh. And then I went to the radio station, applied for a job, and, and got it for... At, copywriter and he was a DJ. I see. So I rumor has it that because of his profession, um, he was able to meet some later in life celebrities such as Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley. Was this, uh, these uh, meetings, I guess, with these celebrities, was it once they were in, when you guys lived in California or was it when you lived in Montana and he was DJing or? Actually, he met these people when he was in high school and would pretend he was working on a school paper. And he interviewed Johnny Cash, met him in a hotel room where Johnny Cash was a little, a few
few sheets to the wind. <laughs> and here is this kid, geeky kid, <laughs> right? And uh, interviewing him. Was he was he a, a very hardcore fan? Is that why he wanted to interview him, or was it more of he was trying to to network and play the part to get a job later in life? Good question. Maybe it's the, maybe it's both. But he <laughs> he just would uh, be a fan of somebody for some reason, and uh, yeah, pursue it. Right. And do you do you know the story of when he met Elvis? Could you share that with us? No, I. Uh, but I can probably get back to you on that. I don't remember exactly. One of them he met in a hotel room, but I think that was Johnny Cash. Right. Yeah, I, I've, I have seen photos of him and Johnny Cash um, from, he was just a young, young yeah, guy. Yeah, he was, he was just a high school student. Right. You were a regular at the local gym? Yes, I, um, I was. I rode my bike to the gym, and then I worked out for an hour. And I was very, very careful to work out, like, from the head down and end up with uh, my legs and my calves. And it really, it really helped in, in, with endurance and with strength. Did you practice bodybuilding? No, not really bodybuilding. I wanted to look like a girl, not, you know, not like a muscle-bound. Did you have an amateur wrestling career prior to forming the Amazon? Yes. I started out um, when we lived in a, a house in California that uh, was probably, well, I'm not sure exactly how far from where the Amazon ended up being, but we wrestled in the backyard and it was a nice private, private yard, it had a nice fence around it, and that's when I started contacting girls that um, were interested in doing something different. And you yourself were, were wrestling them? You you had matches against them in the backyard there? They were mostly practice matches mm -hmm. and uh, just learning what to do and how to do it. And, and But yes, we did have a few regular matches. And you weren't, uh, your group or club wasn't named anything yet, correct? No, it wasn't. Did you release those matches that you had in, at that house? I don't believe that we videotaped or filmed very many of them. We did somewhat. I would have to ask uh, Jack, uh, who was my husband at the time, uh, if we did uh, have any of them videotaped. Okay. Yeah, it seems that he can recall all of those specifics pretty well. So, right. Did you really train under Mildred Burke to go pro? Were you interested in professional wrestling back then? What stopped you from doing professional wrestling? I trained with Mildred Burke because she had girls that were <clears throat> amateur that she was training uh, to bring them into the pro, I think. Um, but I was not interested in uh, pro wrestling at all. It, uh, well, it was fake. And just one time at, at uh, watching them wrestle when they were training, um, just kind of... You know, I, what's the use? You go out there and, and you pretend you're winning or you pretend you're not winning. And it, it just didn't uh, do anything for me. I did two matches while I was under contract uh, with Mildred. <clears throat> One was a mixed match and the other was with a woman. Both uh, films were supposedly destroyed when we terminated the contract with Mildred. Evidently, she didn't destroy both the films, as I later discovered, the mixed matches being sold by L. Scott Sales as part of their Mildred Burke DVDs. And the contract we signed with uh, Mildred was only in effect for three months. We had the Wrestling Confederation terminated the contract when we realized Mildred was money hungry and led a uh, corrupt business. It was something we didn't want to be associated with. Your input to women's liberation cannot and should not be overlooked. Looking back at the 60s and the 70s, was it difficult for a woman to be sporty and athletic back then? It wasn't difficult for me because I had my whole family behind me, 
But yes, I would have to say it was difficult for a lot of women. Uh, there was a lot of prejudice against the jobs and that were more for men and, and um, sports that were more for men. But I really didn't uh, feel too much of it. And so I kind of came out strong. As a, Could you, you know, feel judgment uh, from other people when you would be maybe having a match or if you were in the gym and people knew who you were? Mostly curiosity. Uh, I don't. I know. I didn't feel any judgment from them. Uh, they thought it was kind of cool, mm -hmm. and uh, I would get more questions actually about uh, my weightlifting routine. From men or for women? Where? Who was the predominant question asker as far as the interest goes? Probably more from. I don't know. I, I would. I would probably guess more from men. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the women were interested too. But, but when you figure the the uh, what well, we were in a gym where women were lifting weights, mm -hmm. not necessarily super heavy weights, but that the whole object was for them to shape their body by lifting weights and to get uh, strength in their arms and their legs, especially, and uh, you know, reducing the size of their waistline. Mm -hmm. So um, they were there for a purpose, and lifting weights for a purpose. And a little build-up never hurt anybody, but we did not have the um, you know, the body types to be able to build muscles that were masculine. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, it was a good thing. So when you were recruiting girls to, to join the camp, Amazon, did you ever find there was judgment from other people, maybe their family members or their spouses? I found there was more curiosity than than anybody judging. Um, you know, I it, it was kind of a cool era when uh, women were doing a lot more things and they were lifting weights and and of course running was very popular right then. Mm -hmm. But you do say that it was difficult for women to get started in that athletic realm, mainly because of the people I was surrounded by were more judgmental. Naysayers. Yeah. Is it true that you often wrestled volunteering girls at your place in Garden Grove? And, and if you did, was it just a favorite pastime with good exercise or were the matches filmed or pictures taken and sold? There were photographs and Super 8 film taken of the matches that we had in the backyard. Uh, the girls or women were neighbors mostly. Sharon recruited um, a lot of the women to come over and wrestle and exercise and have fun in the backyard. And where did she recruit them from? Um, from the neighborhood. Gotcha. And so it, essentially it's safe to say that the beginning of your amateur wrestling career began in your backyard of Garden Grove. Yes, it did. Jack could put an ad in the magazine too for the photos and the Super 8 film. So uh, that's where it got started. Thank you. How did you find opponents for these matches that you started holding in the backyard of Garden Grove? To tell you the truth, it was the husbands that would read the different <laughs> articles that were written and encourage their wives to come and uh, meet me, wrestle in our garage with our mats down and all that. That was in Garden Grove or in the backyard mm -hmm. on a sunny day. So um, the husbands were always very involved. I can imagine. Did the local community know that you were a wrestler? Yes, they did. The kids never kept it quiet. I see. They, they were good little recruiters, too. And uh, did the people around you, I guess, know that you were open for challenges, that anybody could come to your house and, and have a match with you? Yes, they did. They did. Did you advertise in the papers to get girls to, to come and wrestle you? We really didn't have to. The uh, papers that or the magazines that would do a story on me would bring in a lot of... Uh, uh, inquiries. I can imagine so. Did the Amazon start in Garden Grove or Pine Valley? It started in Garden Grove. Okay. And was the move to Pine Valley uh, associated with, with wrestling? Did you move to that home because of, of the wrestling business? Uh, yes, um, we did. It um, was a better place to train, actually, and there was more room. Uh, more space, more space to film the... In the in the garage? Yeah, than in the garage. 
Was the location uh, more centrally located than Garden Grove? No, no, it was in like in the mountains. Okay, so you had more more peace and quiet, I guess. More peace and quiet. Uh, more privacy. Lar- larger, larger area to uh, to set up anything that we were doing. Okay. Although we started in, actually in the living room and uh, wrestling in the living room. We couldn't wrestle outside in in uh, Pine Valley. How come? Uh, it was all, there was no grass. Oh, so just pine needles, probably. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. And so after Pine Valley is when you moved to Descanso, correct? Right. And this is where the official, I mean, really officially, you had a gym and, and Club Amazon, Camp Amazon right. began. Right. Okay. And it was also during that time, um, there was a transition between photo sets and shooting 8 millimeter film, and you went to... VHS, correct? Yes. Okay, and do you remember what year that was approximately? No, I don't. Um, let me think. Okay, 1981, probably. So after you were in Descanso in the in the bigger house, correct? correct. And, and the house in Descanso, it had a full-on gym for training your girls, right? Yes, there was a large uh, garage, extra garage, that was kind of like down the driveway. It's a long driveway. And it was perfect for setting up the gym. It even was carpeted. So did you also have a wrestling ring in there as well? Yes, we put up a, a wrestling ring of oh, sorts. I mean, uh, it was our own, well, Jack's kind of plan to... His creation? Know, the creation. Gotcha. Right. And so, so we did photo and film, and then we went to VHS, and I think there was a few matches with, with Beta. And... Yes. Um, the very first match, I mean, we had a screen test that we did. So in 1981, when you made the switch from film to VHS and beta, what, do you remember the first match that was on VHS? Yes, I'm pretty sure it was Nancy Scarvin and Cindy Brooks. And how did that go? Um, it was, it was a, a good match. Both girls had uh, a lot of desire to, <laughs> to win. I heard, a rumor has it that they... Uh, they didn't like each other. And, and why was that? Um, they were just jealous. They both wanted the limelight, and they both wanted to beat the other, you know, uh, soundly. So they had je- jealousy issues over the attention that maybe one was getting as a, as a wrestling right. athlete? Right. Gotcha. Interesting. Is it true that during its existence, California Camp Amazon produced over 600 films of wrestling and boxing matches? No, it'd be about half that because uh, we did... Uh, um, films and photos, and they were counted. The numbers went up. So, for example, your first match would be Jadelle Dulong versus Nancy Hogle, and then item number two would be Jadelle Dulong versus Nancy Hogle uh, in film, if it wouldn't been offered. So, right. photo set and film, and yes. they would have in sequential order. Okay. And what, if yes, what was the key to such a high level of productivity? Because while it wasn't 600 films, 300 plus films is, is pretty amazing. That's 300 matches. I, how were you able to, to produce so many in, in just a few amount of years? We um, we worked, my husband and I worked together on, on everything and, and we filmed everything because we didn't want something to happen that was exciting and not have it on film. Capture it for your fans. Right, and for them. right. Uh, would you film more than or hold more than one match in a day? Sometimes, sometimes. Would your girls ever compete in more than one wrestling match themselves? No, not, not, I don't think it ever happened that they would compete in more than one. So they had time to rest up and recuperate? Right, right. So who helped you do this, this huge job as far as uh, running Camp Amazon? Uh, Actually, Jack did that. He, your uh, husband, Jack. My husband, Jack, yes. He was able to get photos published and that, and that started it off in the wrestling magazines photos and um, he he just had the mind to be able to go out and and drum up interest right he definitely had the personality to get you guys um, started I think uh, probably radio his, his background in radio probably helped with that right right, right. so he was your, your public relations yes person yes, that, um, that's a good good way to put it and you know, from what I've seen, the records that he's kept throughout the years, um, he was very, very detailed in his expenses and um, his documentation. Uh, so I guess you could say he, he 
played a pretty big role in the organization aspect of the oh, business. Oh, total role. I, I didn't organize any of um, you know any of that end of it at all. I went along with it and I helped him right. where he needed help, but I don't have that kind of uh, mind that would be able to develop what he developed. Um, right. You know, with with the. Um, interest from the magazines and all that. So he was the operational, organizational, and, and, and PR side of the business, and you were... I'm the one that lifted the weights and ran. Right, <laughs> and, and, and you also provided mentoring for the girls, I assume. And well, yes, yes. Right. So. right, so you did the business, he ran the business. Right. Okay, from the back side, anyway. Yeah. Gotcha. So describe to me a day, an average day at Camp Amazon. How was the camp ran? We had a gym. And the gym contained a Nautilus machine, which is a fourth station um, unit that you would do different exercises on for your legs, for your arms, bench press. And um, we had, of course, the mat and everything set up. The girls could run. Uh, there was a, it was in the country, and there was a very nice trail that I ran on. And uh, sometimes uh, they would actually go to the far end of the trail um, by car, and then have to run back, and then come back, you know, on the trail, running, or sometimes a midnight walk when the uh, moon was out bright. Oh my goodness! So they were running at midnight. Did they? Were they happy about this? Oh, they would do it on purpose. Oh. They would schedule it, you know, when it was going to be a full moon. And then whether Jack wanted to go with them to, uh, and I would drop him off, or he would drop me off with some of the girls, and we'd walk to back to a place that was not too terribly far from um, the Amazon. So and it was a midnight we, wrestling, a moonlight midnight wrestling run. Yeah, <laughs> a training run. A training run, and, and so did each. So besides the running and the lifting weights, how did you how did you um, decide? Who did what? I mean, was it was it specific to each girl? Each girl had uh, different areas that they wanted to strengthen or or develop or or trim down on or whatever. Was it their choice, or did you also have some say as as far as maybe a weakness that you saw in their performance on a match that you would then coach to? I, would, I might mention it to them, but generally it was their own, you know, their own interests, their own um, desires. And uh, all these girls had a strong desire to win, and that was the most important thing, I think. So the girls, would they, when they came through and, and came to your camp, were they staying there? Um, did they live there all the time, or how long did the average girl no, stay? They, w they would come and stay, and for whatever length of time they wanted to have matches set up. Can you and give an example of, of an average time period that somebody would stay? Uh, probably three or four days. Okay. Would be, you know, average. And, and during this day, was it uh, usual for them to have a, a scheduled match or a planned match? Generally, that was why they would come. So they knew in advance that they were going yes. to have a, a wrestling competition. Yes. Yes. Okay. And so you, were they trained there, or were they expected to have their training when they were, had their training taken care of before they arrived? Um. Well, that's kind of a, a two-sided question. Their, their exercise part of their training, they should be doing it at home mm -hmm. also, as well as there. And uh, the weightlifting and things, if they could, if they had a, a way to be able to lift weights. You know. Right, to remain active. And, and Yeah, and they should remain active and in good shape and uh, uh, build up their endurance. And that was one of the big things, the building up the endurance, for me anyway. Which is important that they continue doing that at home to to help build that. Right, and most of the girls were active that way anyway. Okay, so when they arrived to to your camp, you were more or less putting on the finishing touches. Yeah, um, we would uh, you know anything that I could see that they were lacking in or needed uh, some training for, then I would try to point that out and and help them out that way. Okay, we also had a massage table. Oh, did you have a masseuse that you'd hired that came in? Uh, there was one that Jack knew that uh, would come in and, and do uh, massages. So after a day of training, they would get a massage? Yes. And probably after a match? or Yeah, nice. if, they, if they wanted it. And did you have a, a hot tub or a pool there? They had a swimming pool. It wasn't a very large pool, um, but it was, it was really nice to go jump in when you were done 
lifting weights or having a match or whatever. Just, you I know, bet. I bet it was refreshing. Cool I, yeah. I can't imagine that you had air conditioning back in your gym back in the, in the early 80s. And not in the gym. We did have a fan. And uh, it was a six-car garage that was converted into a gym. So we had the double doors and the single door on, on one side, too. Opened up? Opened up. You know, we'd open them all the way up if we wanted to. So there was some breeze coming through. Yes, yes. And then there were windows on the sides. That sounds lovely. How were the wrestlers compensated? Uh, we were able to pay them for the release of their films and videos. And that's how we built the Amazon and how, we, how they got something for their work. So was it at the start of a contract or per match that was released? It was per match. And uh, the girls knew that the better they did, the more matches they would get. Okay, so um, what was the, the average pay? What did the pay start out at per match in, in, the, in the times when you were in California at Camp Amazon? I believe $50. Per match? Yes. Now jumping ahead to Montana, what did you pay the girls there? I think 75 And then in Washington? Uh, probably the same. Okay, great was an article about the Amazon that stated that teaching Nancy Scarvin submission wrestling was practically a dare. Is that true? Nancy and Susan were in a beauty contest that was for the, the town mm -hmm. of Westminster. And they wanted me to put on a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I meaning Big Jack, was uh, we said that I would challenge the winner of the beauty contest mm. because I was promoting women's wrestling right. you know, and um, teach her to, to wrestle on stage that for that day, you know. And, and so the winner was Nancy Scarvin, obviously, from the beauty contest? Yeah. Did you know that Nancy Scarvin was going to be the winner? Was it already predetermined? No. No, okay. So you could have ended up wrestling her sister had yeah. she had won the beauty contest? Yeah. So that kind of right there created the beginning of that sibling rivalry, it sounds like. Yeah. Which of the Scarvin sisters was really the best on the mat? Oh, definitely Nancy. And why? She was probably more into it, and she was more fit than the other two. Um, and the other two were who? There was Susan Scarvin and Lynetta Scarvin. Now, Len Lynetta was small and um, wasn't really... Um, as fit to wrestle our girls, they were. Uh, Meaning fit or must or strong? Strong. Okay. And and fit also, mm -hmm. and yeah, she uh, she wasn't quite as strong, but she was a good cheerleader. <laughs> and Nancy by far had the most matches that were released out of any of your girls, correct? Yes, yeah, she was very popular, and there was always a demand for her matches and. Uh, she was easier to contact because she was the uh, youngest. And how old was she when she started wrestling for you? She was only 16. And her parents supported? Uh, oh, yes. They were very supportive. They thought it was wonderful. And who would you say would be the most talented disciple of yours at California Amazon? I would have to say that uh, Nancy Scarvin was. She um, just really enjoyed being filmed, she enjoyed the fight, she enjoyed uh, everything about it. So she was a natural? She was a natural. There are instances where the actual filmed match left one of the girls, or both of them, unhappy about the result? And did they continue the dispute by wrestling privately off the camera? There were some, sometimes, when, yeah, the girls would be very upset if they lost the match or something, especially the Scarvin sisters, and they would continue at least verbally uh, continue the fight, but uh, um, I think we would have turned the camera back on if they, if they went out and started wrestling again. And there was none of, no specific instances of, of actual fighting that you can remember physically? Oh, no. 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 They, uh, they knew a little bit better. They, they, they had a little bit more respect for me, I think, than that. Right. Uh, they didn't want me to take them on. Could you sense the hostility in the air once a match was done? And Well, generally, by the time it was done, they were worn out. And uh, I don't think they had any more left in them to, you know, to be able to go another round. I think they were pretty well 
uh, worn out by the time the, the match was over and, and they declared a winner. So all in all, you kept it pretty drama-free, or their exhaustion kept it pretty drama-free. Yeah, they were tired. Uh, generally, they wanted to go jump in the pool. Right. Was there any session wrestling, as in private sessions? Sometimes the practice sessions would uh, get a little bit out of hand, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but... Meaning, was there any private uh, wrestling matches between the girls and people that where they were hired? Um, you know, well, there were training matches where the girls would sometimes they would get a little bit out of hand when I would use my girls to train new girls. But um, no, I there weren't any private ones. I, I'd have to ask Jack. So that. so no, there was no. Um, no matches uh, for profit with your girls and other people without your knowledge. Oh, they better not have been. <laughs> <laughs> no, they wouldn't have no. They would have no way of getting into the gym. But they could have done it at home, right? You know, in their backyard or something. And I do think the Scarvin sisters uh, were wrestling in their backyard, but not with outsiders mm -hmm. with just, each other. Just basically. for practice. Yeah, their mother was really into it. Was it part of the contract that your girls couldn't do private sessions? No. It was just we didn't really have a contract. With them, I see. Are there any public or private wrestling events that were never captured on film or camera that you could remember? I can't remember any. Uh, there was one in particular. I can't remember where we went for it. But uh, we were using a regular, a regular uh, ring. And there was other, there was boxing and stuff that evening, but um, I can't really remember any that weren't videotaped and filmed. That were for sale. Yeah. There was a couple public events where you guys were showcased, uh, when like you said when there was boxing events going on, things like that. Yeah. Those were or were not recorded. Um. Well, we reported them, but I don't know that we... Uh, yeah, I think we had a few that were for sale, actually. Mm -hmm. But they were they were done different because there, there was an audience, and mm -hmm. you know. Because uh, I don't see... I don't remember seeing those in the collection at all, so... I think there was one in particular, mm -hmm. but I don't remember. I think it was probably in the first maybe ten item numbers. It feels like your family was very supportive of your work. Your children, Sharon and Jack, your stepdaughter, Liz, your granddaughter, Jacquinette, they, they were all supportive. Were they fast learners? Oh, yeah, <laughs> they were. They, they loved it. It was, um, you know, active and, and fun, and everybody was super nice. So. so how did you, let's go through each one. We'll start with your children, Sharon and Jack. Mm -hmm. How did you get them enthusiastic about wrestling? Well, they had to, they had to work. Um, they were filming, and uh, uh, Sharon was the very often uh, corner girl, and we put them totally to work. They had to clean up afterwards, so uh, it was a family project. And you know, counting back to my own um, experience with wrestling, I think that's kind of how you got me started in it as well, Grandma. Is I would go and I'd watch the matches and be the corner girl, mm -hmm. and and I'd bring my girlfriends with and they would help as well. And I mean, honestly, I, I liked to go because there was good food there. <laughs> and then it started to get pretty exciting. And the, and the more I found out about um, the hype, I guess, and the followers that you had, you know, I I became a little starstruck, I guess, by what you were doing. And so then I wanted to be a part of it. And you know, I I felt like I had some shoes to fill since I was, you know, your granddaughter. And so that's where I got excited in it. And and how do you think you got Liz into it? Was it uh, the rivalry between her and I that made her want to do it? or? Yeah, I think every all the girls were kind of excited about being filmed. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, Liz, um, she was pretty much of a natural, too. And she 
I think she was a little bit envious of you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she um, she did a good job of it. She, she also had the temperament for it. Yeah. Funny that you say that they enjoy being filmed because I don't even really remember noticing that there was a camera on. I was so focused on on winning. Right. Especially when it came to to Liz, I guess, you know, and, yeah. and the competitiveness there, but I didn't even think about the fact that things were being recorded at the moment. To me it was all very real and very here and now, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that, that's true of uh, a lot of the girls didn't didn't pay any attention to the camera. Right. You you quickly forget anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You you get that competition going in you and it's kind of exciting and you you want to win and so so is it fair to say that it didn't take much to get them enthusiastic about wrestling it didn't seem to um yeah it, if they just watched it for a couple of times they were ready to try it out and when we got done filming and everything anybody that was kind of a newcomer to watching even would they would get out there and try it you couldn't help it. Right, right. What was the public's general reaction to the Camp Amazon? Uh, curiosity, for one thing. And then when they would learn a little bit more about it, then they were really interested. And um, it was kind of a time when uh, I think women were kind of coming to the front with sports and things, too. So it was, it was a good time to have it open to the public. Not open to the public, but introduced to the public and um, and their reaction was good positive what about uh, like your family members and maybe your neighbors how did they react to what you were doing I, I would have to say uh, uh, their reaction was good it was a positive reaction some of them were really curious and and uh, would want to either get themselves involved or um, there were men in the neighborhood that wanted their wives involved. Right. So they would come and watch and, and uh, thought it was a really good exercise and good for women to, to uh, you know, come out and be a little bit stronger. Were there any pressures from the officials to the organization? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had a visit from the um, nearby town um, legal people, I don't know, cops, they came, they, they wanted to know what was going on, I don't know if they thought we were doing porno or what, but uh, yeah, they visited us one day, and it was actually kind of funny, so they went through the house, and I don't know what they were looking for, but, you know, we weren't hiding anything, they could have come and watched matches anytime we had them, or training sessions. So did they show up at your house with a search warrant? Yes, they did. How? So maybe let's give a little bit more background to this, because my following, my next question is, is it true that the camp was shut down by the local sheriff's department after they sent an undercover policewoman who wrestled Debbie Para, and how did it happen? So it sounds like these two questions are related. Um, so going back, can you maybe um, recount the undercover policewoman and that wrestling match that was held with Debbie? Um, yes. The uh, undercover police women came. There were two of them, and they they wanted to wrestle, and I, I, they wanted to be filmed. They were kind of pushing for that. <laughs> but to tell you the truth, uh, they were not. They were nowhere near as attractive as my least attractive girl. So I did not want to film them. I didn't want to waste the money on filming them, and uh, they had no quality as far as being, you know, if they were just competitive, but they weren't. And and they they just, they weren't woman enough to, to be worthy of being filmed. So I really squirmed my way out of it because I did not want to waste the, the time or the money for the release, you know, or I didn't want, want them. They weren't, they weren't, Amazon material. So were they posing <clears throat> as being minors? Did they... Because it seems like that's what oh, they were trying yes, to catch you yes. in. Um, one of them was. And I said, well, I couldn't film her. 
because her mother would have to be there, or mother or father or guardian, and they would have to sign, you know, a release for them. And um, that I would not film anybody without, you know, without a proper release. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, but I'll teach you how to wrestle, but you can't, you know, get paid or be, be filmed. So was that the one that wrestled Debbie? Um, yeah. Was it, so was the match with Debbie recorded or was it off, off camera? I don't really remember. I think it was off camera. Okay. Either that or we just filmed a little bit of it or something. So did they actually shut down the camp? Um, for that day. So they, they wrestled and then they showed back up at the house with a warrant, I'm guessing, after this happened to search the house. Yeah. And did they, um gather and collect evidence or matches or or anything or um they may have taken some videos but i don't remember that they actually they didn't find anything so nothing came about this in, of this investigation no I mean, no I, we we went to court but they they were it was kicked out for what <laughs> they had nothing gotcha video producers in the 60s and 70s produced staged combat, and rarely any truly competitive action. Some of Ron DeVorkin's material would be an exception. When you started the Amazon, how strong was the demand in competitive submission wrestling? Well, then, when you see two girls, you know, coming out in, in a supposed match, and it's so phony, you know, the first thing they do is, is get a head scissors and and uh, it's just, just phony. You can see it. You know that that's not the way anybody wrestles. And that's, um, I kind of missed the point of your question, but. Well, so you knew from the get-go what you wanted to offer and, and that the demand for the competitive submission wrestling would be there. Yeah. It, yeah I didn't grow up with four brothers for nothing. <laughs> you know, it, the phony stuff looks so bad. And that was your own personal opinion, and, and obviously Jack's, but how did you guys know that, that this would be um, reciprocated and enjoyed by the people out there? I mean, Well, we, we were just doing what we liked to do. Um, we went to Ron Dvorkin's, and Jack took me there one time, and um, we were going to you know, see what was going on with, with the wrestling. And that's where I really got my distaste for the phony stuff. Mm. Was we sat there and, you know, it was in, in his living room and, and two girls were faking it so bad. I mean, they would never have made it as actresses. Do you sure. remember what girls those were? No. No, you don't know. And remember I don't think I ever saw them again. Okay. So that's, I guess, what made up your mind about what type of product it was you were going to deliver or offer? Well, it made me want to show people that there was such a thing as real wrestling for girls. Did you personally write the transcripts for the matches? No, Jack did that. And was it his idea to write them and mail them with the videos? Yes, it was. And, of course, he was there. He knew it at what happened and everything, so... He seemed to have the personality for it, too, coming from the radio right. business. Um, he was a, an announcer, right? Right. Um, they, those transcripts are so incredibly detailed. I have fans, I would say, a few times a year contacting me, asking me if I still have those scripts. Um, they are by far one of the most enjoyed um, pieces of your collection, I, I think. And so he handled the writing of them. Right. Uh, but he witnessed every match with his own eyes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you know that Elvis Presley was a huge fan of female wrestling? Oh, yes. He was a fan and connoisseur of many of your items. Supposedly, they found a number of your films in one of his closets at Graceland after he died. Did you ever personally meet Elvis? Yes, I did. You did. Can, yeah. you, can you tell me about that? Um... I can't remember what we had gone to see. I think it was a, uh, I think he was on stage, but it was like a monologue or something that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this would probably be in L.A. 
and so we did go see him and he knew we were coming and he had us sit in the front row mm -hmm. and it was kind of you know exciting to meet Elvis and we also met his brother and we had breakfast with him in the morning with Elvis. That's that's awesome. Did did he ever witness uh, any of the matches that were held at Camp Amazon live or while they were being filmed? No, not not in person. But uh, he was a customer of yours. Uh, yes, he was uh, non de plume. <laughs> that's how he signed his uh, his. So he remained anonymous. Yeah. Were you and the world boxing champion Ken Norton close friends? can't say we were close friends. We liked each other. We, you know, when we'd run into each other at, at a gym or something, you know, there was always a good visit. So did he enjoy female submission wrestling? I think he did, yeah. Did he watch any matches? Yeah. He watched one of mine. Between you and who? I can't remember who it was. Was it held at the gym? Yeah, gotcha. at the gym. And that's where your, your friendship kind of developed with Ken, was at the gym? Yeah. Was your second husband, Keith, interested in female submission wrestling? He wasn't interested in the, in the same way that Big Jack was. So honest. not so much the management side of it, but maybe the, yeah, he, the spectator side of it? Yes, yes, yes. And he did a couple matches where he wrestled the girls, correct? I think so. Yes. So please tell us more about the Montana camp. Uh, you moved back to Polson, Montana in 1984 and started up a, a wrestling camp there. And did you have difficulty finding girls to wrestle for you? No, I think most Montana girls are pretty athletic anyway. They were very outdoorsy. A little surly. <laughs> uh, what was the difference that you noticed between Montana camp and the California Amazon camp? Uh, it was probably more difficult to induce the California girls to the wrestling. They would usually be brought by a friend. So um, so they were a little bit more unapproachable or standoffish to the, the idea? Uh, they, were, they were curious, but um, they weren't forthcoming. You know, what, what would be the word? They weren't... Uh, I think that's a good word. So in, in Montana, though, how did you... What was your approach to recruiting girls to wrestle for you? Did you post in the paper? Did you have Sharon and Jack seek out friends? Or how did this work? I, it was all, you know, they, they heard of me. And, and my mother was, <laughs> she was always putting things in the paper. If, if they came out in, in a newspaper somewhere else, she'd always put it in the Polson paper. So I was not unknown when I moved there. I see. So it did make it easier for you to start a foundation... Right, and the girls are very athletic in Montana. So they kind of jumped in line. Yeah. Please tell us about your move to Linden, Washington, and the founding of Washington Women's Wrestling and Boxing Club. My children had uh, moved over to Linden, and of course there's the family thing. I'm, uh, I'm very close to my family. So um, I decided to follow them, and I do have brothers here, and in uh, Washington and other family members so it uh, it was a nice move I enjoy the state and I founded another wrestling camp of course and that was Washington Wrestling and Boxing Club right and I remember that you would film or hold the matches down at the the Legion Hall down in Ferndale there was it was it the Legion Hall was it okay yeah, I didn't remember that it was Legion Hall. Um, yes, and um, everybody seemed to be just as receptive as anywhere else that I'd been. So uh, The girls were pretty good wrestlers and, and looking forward to doing a different sport. And where did you recruit the girls? How did you find them? Um, well, again, family. Um, they always get to know the neighbors and everything. So I, it isn't very difficult to uh, uh, recruit when they find out that you're doing something that is a little bit different, like women's wrestling. Right, and, and there's compensation behind it, too, for getting paid to, to, to do a fun competitive sport, right? Right, right. 
Um, and so what would you say the differences uh, were between the club that you started in Washington compared to the Montana club and, and Camp Amazon? They're very, very similar. Very similar. Uh, our facilities were different, of course. But um, the receptiveness of the people that uh, find out about the wrestling, they're curious and they get a little excited about it, actually. And the girls uh, are easy to recruit. They, they love it. They, uh, usually they're recruited by a friend. Mm -hmm. I found that when I was uh, watching a lot of the matches, <clears throat> excuse me, there was quite a bit of uh, support from the girls as family friends. And I just remember going and being a corner girl. There was always quite a bit of people in the audience and a, and a lot of excitement and, and energy um, during those matches, which was exciting to, to see. When did you stop filming and why? I stopped filming matches in 1998. Uh, I was six to eight years old and I was ready to retire from the working world. I bet. Every once in a while, girls would contact me to wrestle. And, and I would film a match uh, because I still had a passion, you know, for the sport and a real respect for the strong women that contacted me. Right. Um, I continued my partnership with L. Scott up until several years ago when I gave my granddaughter Jack Burnett, or Jackie as we call her, <laughs> the business. And Jackie is, has uh, plans to someday create a website where my um, where my fans can purchase photos and uh, DVDs. Yeah, DVDs of my material. Uh, she currently is working on finding some missing material and organizing the collection. She has her work cut out for her. Yes, thank you, Grandma. <laughs> um, so it might be a few years until until I or we, you know, see this happen. I'm also planning a wedding at the moment, so yeah, we're it? taking a time out from putting together the collection right now. <laughs> yeah, and that might be a few years before this happens. I'm in the interim, um, and I ask my uh, fans to refrain from purchasing my material from other um, distributors as they are pirated, and it doesn't help me to start up uh, with material, to offer material, to, to have that pirated material, um, you know, taken away so that I don't have any income from it. So what you're saying is is that any material that's out there on the internet um, that's being offered through a website or a, a producing type of site is not um, authentic material from you. They have not been given permission from you to redistribute, correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, they have no permission to, to offer it. It's not going to help me to have them offering it and then, you know, that's lacking for right. my chance to set it up again. We do not get any income or royalties from anything that is purchased from any other third-party site. But with that being said, anything that is purchased off of eBay that's from a party, private party, um, Grandma has no problem with people obviously buying these items because those are from collectors, and, and, and she has no problem with those being repurchased and resold. Um, anything yeah. else you want to add, Grandma? Well, yeah, some of the collectors, uh, you know, their family is offering the material. Right. And that would be okay because it belongs to them. They exactly. legally paid for it to me, you know, so that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, so stay tuned, fans. Someday. <laughs> Judell's material coming soon. Mixed wrestling was never at the spotlight in any of the three camps. Was the demand for mixed wrestling low? No, I wouldn't say it was low. Um, I, you know, about average. But the, uh, the girls liked to wrestle with their boyfriends or their husbands or 
you know, whoever, and they felt like they could wrestle with a man and um, improve probably a little bit better than when they were wrestling with a girl because when they're wrestling with a girl, it's, you know, all out. The girls all have a different uh, strategy, so it it was good for them to wrestle with uh, their boyfriends or, or anybody that came along that, uh, that wanted to wrestle with them and that they wanted to wrestle. Almost like uh, more of a challenge in a way. It was a challenge, and it was good training. Did you find that um, the customer customer demand for for your mixed matches were they more interested in the mixed matches or the girl on girl matches that you had? I have to say, in all honesty, it was the girl on girl, but the mixed wrestling was uh, definitely a high interest. They liked to see the difference in how strong the the girls were against uh, a male. Uh, opponent. Right, especially if they had a favorite girl that they right. tend to favor. How competitive were the mixed wrestling matches? They were pretty competitive. They were, you know, very because I told the girls they could cheat. <laughs> Do you think that the men were more competitive with the women because they didn't want to look bad on the camera losing to a girl? Uh, yes and no. Um, I think they really enjoyed wrestling with the women because because I, I think they were surprised at how strong the women were. And who wouldn't want to wrestle with a woman in a bikini, right? Right. And I I did uh, tell the girls, if you're wrestling with a man or fighting or anything with a man, it is fair to cheat. So mm-hmm. you don't do that with the other girls. But uh, if you're wrestling with a guy, yes, you can cheat. And you personally have done a few mixed matches. Um, do you remember who... Who you had matches with? Uh, I had an outdoor match with John, and um, I don't remember being filmed wrestling with Jack, but I must have been. You mean your husband yeah. at the time? And um, there were there was um, oh okay Dave I wrestled with Dave. And, and so Dave and John those those matches were both released. I believe so. Right, and the scorecard on those, who won? I won them. Of course you did. And then um, the matches that you had with your husband, Jack, those were more training matches yeah, held off, off camera at yeah. home, correct? Yeah. Is the joy of defeating a man stronger than that of defeating a woman? Well, it kind of depends on who the woman is, but yes, I have to say, I, I would say that, yes. And why? Um, because they're supposed to be the stronger sex, and they're... You know, and they come off that way, especially in the beginning of a match, and then to see the shock on their face when you, you know, you're able to take them down, you're able to pin them down, you're able to get uh, loud submission from them. So you're dominating them essentially. Yes, and that's very definitely enjoyable. And so, the uh, the chip on your shoulder it gives you is. It's quite an overwhelming feeling, I'm sure, huh? Right. <laughs> right. When you would rac- um, practice with your husband Jack at home uh, and you beat him, did you did you gloat about it later? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we also, uh, there was a little area at the side of our house and we filled it with water. It was just dirt. Mm-hmm. So we had mud matches in there. Oh. <laughs> that was quite a mess. <laughs> I bet. Legend has it... That during your entire career, you only lost one match. And who was that one match that you lost to? Helene uh, Lusgarden, and I will qualify that. (laughs) It was um, a submission match. I never lost a a submission match, and I never said I'd give. But it was also a pin match. And uh, she really got me in a pin, but it took her an hour and ten minutes. So, was the original match supposed to be submission, but because the fall took so long, you guys turned it into a pin, or was it agreed upon from the beginning? No, I don't really remember how that came about, but it was after an hour and ten minutes of, you know, I I don't know if we just agreed at that time. I think we did. And she very she was a very strong girl. I don't know if she went on any other matches or not. But. How did you meet her? 
Uh, there, she was in the New York Club, and they just, it was uh, by mail. I see. I see. And, and was there ever talks about having a rematch with her? Oh, we talked about it at the time, but I don't, I don't uh, remember anything, you know, really getting ironed out as far as that goes. Right, nothing that came about. Have you ever lost to anyone other than Helene? No, um, and I, I do qualify that as being a pin match, but also the one thing I had in the back of my mind, every match I went out there, if they trained harder than me and beat me, they deserved it. But if they didn't train, train harder than me, then they did not deserve to, to beat me. So obviously no one trained harder than you. <laughs> no, they didn't. But I trained every day. Right, you were pretty um, dedicated to that, that's for sure. So besides Celine, which was a pin match, you still hold the champion or the title for submission. For submission. Yeah. People say that nobody was ever able to make you submit on the mat. Going through some of the picture sets from your matches, we can see pictures of you in almost inescapable body scissors and Nelson combinations. Many, if not everyone I've seen on the mat would have given up eventually. How did you survive these situations? I think my training, I, I would think about my training and know that I trained hard enough to beat this person. So it would kind of give me an, an extra little bit of a push. And I knew that I had more endurance than anybody. And how did you know that? <laughs> because I ran every day. And the running will give you endurance. And I also, every other day, I worked out with the weights in the gym. So you were strong, you had endurance, but how did you bear through the pain, and how did you... I can't say anybody really hurt me. Okay. How did you maneuver out of those those holds? Because uh, some of them looked was, impossible. That, that was the hard part. <laughs> I just, um, for one thing, you know how how tired you are yourself. You know how much effort you're putting in into it yourself. And then you kind of judge your opponent because they have to put that much effort in and they have to be every bit as tired as you are. Right. So if you can just outlast that and uh, keep going, and I am kind of stubborn. <laughs> so you wait for your window of opportunity. Right. <laughs> Why do you think you are such a great wrestler? Is it the anatomy, the genetics, your natural competitiveness, your heavy practice schedules? What made you the best? I think probably my family. Um, my father was a very strong man, and just to see the twinkle in his eye when, when I had a wrestling match was enough to make me continue and, and do the best I could. Um, and then the training, and the, but the backing from, from everybody it was the most important thing. You had quite a, a supportive family and fan club, I would say. Right, yes. So that's what kept you going, and that's what brought you to the top. Right. What do you consider to be the most powerful tool in your arsenal as a submission wrestler? Uh, I think probably my strong arms, but my strong legs were a close second. So when you had a rest, um, an opponent in a, in a hold, what hold was it that usually made them give? Um... The full Nelson or the body scissors. And was there any strategy that you had when you went to apply either of those? Uh, just to, to be able to get them into position. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they didn't know what you were doing, then, then it was easier. But uh, getting them into position and controlling their legs so their legs couldn't get around you. Of course, if their legs were really strong, you didn't want them to get to catch you. Right. So uh, just keeping out of the holds or if they're getting it on you, being able to change your position so you could slip out of it. Do you remember what you used to tell me about applying the leg scissors, Grandma? How to really make them give? Oh, just straighten your legs straight out and squeeze as hard as you could and shake it. Right. Yeah, there's nothing worse than being shaken with something around your stomach. I gotta admit that was probably the best piece of advice you ever gave me. It definitely um, worked in my favor in <laughs> a few of my matches. So thank you for that.
Have you ever accidentally knocked someone out with a head scissors? No, I, I haven't. Have you ever had to subdue an aggressive person in real life using any of your skills? Well, being, being aggressive uh, will um, tone somebody down right away. And there, there have been times in my life when, when somebody has uh, decided that they were going to take me out or something and and uh, that I, I think just my standing up to them and, and um, backing them down. But you've never physically had to bust out a, a full Nelson or, or some leg scissors on, on a person in a real life situation? It sure seems like I have, but I can't remember. Oh, yes, yes, I can remember. There, there was a girl that was with her boyfriend that came over to Jack's and my house and... Uh, she was uh, being very aggressive to me. I don't know why, but yeah, I took her down on the living room floor. And to put her in her place, or put it, yeah, well, I put her <laughs> on the floor in my place. Was she being threatening to you? Yes. How? Yes. Um, you know, it was a while back, so I don't remember exactly. If she was she was being very uh, very loud and very aggressive uh, vocally, and I don't remember if she had anything in her hands or not, but she definitely was ready to attack me, and so I just took her down. And what happened after that? <laughs> her boyfriend ran outside and watched it through the window. <laughs> and did she get up and leave? When I led her up, <laughs> he took her out. <laughs> Have you ever wrestled Linda Schultz? Uh, Linda Schultz and I wrestled in 1964 in the garage when I lived in Garden Grove. She was tall and willowy. I easily beat her in three or four falls. She wasn't really into wrestling, but her husband was. So she agreed to the match. What about Joe Bray? <clears throat> Joe Bray never came to the West Coast, and she never returned our phone calls when we came to the uh, East Coast. We assumed that her husband didn't want to have her lose a match since he was trying to build her legend. And Jane, it doesn't say a last name, just Jane. Uh, no, not sure what Jane you're referring to. The only one I can think of would be Jane Seaman, who was married to Larry Seaman, who later became the husband of Joan Weiss. Jane broke her leg, which pretty much ended her wrestling career. Sounds like Larry's pretty much the, the lady's wrestling man, huh? Yeah. What about Joan Weiss? Did you ever wrestle her, Larry's second wife? No, Joan didn't really wrestle competitively at the time. She wasn't out on the circuit until about 1980 when I was getting ready to retire. And Bonnie Weiss? Never heard of her. Angela Mack? I never had the opportunity to meet them. They also came around after my career. And then Kathy from the UK? Again, not sure what Kathy you're referring to. Kathy... Black, the boxer, she was <clears throat> into boxing and I was not. My daughter Sharon boxed her when we were in the UK, so uh, just to appease Kathy's husband. Okay, and then the second part to this question that the fans are wondering is, out of these um, wrestlers, which one do you think was the toughest? And I know that... Um, your your most challenging match isn't one of these people that um, the fans were asking about, but... Um, Helen Lusgarden um, was probably the toughest wrestling, uh, the toughest wrestler that I competed against in regards to the length of the match. None of my opponents could beat me. I was unstoppable. I had endurance, strength, and drive. And... I was real athletic, and they weren't. There are rumors that even though you tried to get Sherry Whitlow to wrestle with you, she would not accept the challenge. Or maybe it was Rhonda Vorkin's decision. Is this true? Please, please recount the real story here. Boy, that's a while back. Um, Sherry, I think, was Sherry was at our place once. I know she saw the wrestling mat. And I think we worked out a little bit, but uh, I don't think Sherry wanted to actually wrestle me after, especially after we worked out. You know, we just kind of fooled around on the mat and traded 
uh, holds. You're saying she was intimidated when she saw your strength and your muscles? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and, and so She was more girly. <laughs> do you know if Ron was pushing her to wrestle you or if he was discouraging her from doing so? What was his think, take on it? I don't think Ron would have been either. Uh, yeah, yeah, they put the camera on us. Definitely he would have encouraged that part. But I don't think... Ron wasn't the pushy type. He wouldn't have pushed me into wrestling Sherry, and he wouldn't have pushed Sherry into wrestling me. But he would have put it out there in front of us as a good opportunity and, and a good seller and that kind of thing. He would have been positive about it, but he wouldn't have been forceful. Gotcha. So maybe from a business standpoint, he didn't uh, push Sherry to wrestle you? No, he would have. Because he would have profited. I gotcha. Yeah. And uh, just, just for fun, if you would have wrestled Sherry, who do you think would have won? <laughs> it wouldn't have lasted very long. It's more of a rhetorical question, I right. suppose. <laughs> what was Orrin Heller's contribution to the Amazon? And what type of relationship did you and him have? We were introduced to Orrin through Doyle Russell, the owner of Athena Enterprises. Uh, Orrin had sought us out as he was really into strong girls and women's weightlifting things. Uh, he was a very sweet older gentleman. He had a camera and we didn't. He filmed the first match we released on film, items four and five, Linda Schultz. He also recorded several other matches we <clears throat> had in our backyard when we lived in Westminster. Our relationship ended when we obtained our own camera from one of our fans, Wim Cage and Brink. I guess we didn't need Orrin anymore, and we didn't want anyone else recording our material. I was very fond of Orrin, and he is responsible for taking us to the next level by recording our first matches on film. Have you ever met Eric Stanton? If so, please share. Eric Stanton was the best uh, dramatized cartoonist at that time. Um, my husband, Jack, was a huge fan of his work. Eric sent us a three-foot-by-three-foot poster of three girls fighting with uh, leashes and, and whips. It can't, I can't exactly remember. And it said to the am, amazing Amazon from Eric Snanton. <clears throat> we had it displayed in our gym when we had Club Amazon. Jack contacted Eric when he was in New York, and they met for dinner. I wasn't on that trip with him for some reason. Eric uh, admired what we were doing, and we admired what he was doing. We were fans of each other. Do you follow the subculture nowadays? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I feel that... A lot of it, or most of it, isn't real, and um, I just haven't followed it since I retired. And why do you think that it's not real? Well, it's pretty obvious. Um, I, I knew what was real when I was wrestling, and I could tell if the girls got out there and were faking it. It's just, uh, it's just not real. There is a transition in the production of most of the video companies today from classic submission wrestling to featuring jiu-jitsu and judo techniques. Do you think that this is a positive thing? Well, it could be positive, it could be negative. It's a, uh, but the type of wrestling we did um, was, I think, more real. Uh, not that they're necessarily not real, but it's, it's more of your feelings, your, your, um, your holds and everything. They're, they're more like a fight, maybe. Maybe that's the difference. Like a, a contact sport, or yeah, yeah. Well, obviously they're a contact sport, but um, I think it's it's a little more competitive, the way we wrestled, and uh, a little more killer instinct, maybe. Competitive, because it relied more on each individual woman's strength. Yes, yes, definitely, and and their training, of course. To where the, um, the newer. The newer material is more based on, I guess, skill or experience, or yeah, and rules. 
I, I don't think we had all that many rules. No, no, you definitely. <laughs> but didn't. ours was more of a, a fight, and theirs is more of a competition. Maybe that's it. Okay. Where would one go nowadays to buy films produced by you? The place I would say would be th through my granddaughter. She has all the rights to my material and the only person that has the rights to sell my material. So, um, you know, anyone else that you are supporting is taking support away from my granddaughter's possible, you know, entry into the uh, wrestling producing, the, you know, the matches and things. Uh, so, you know, anything you do that supports somebody else is taking away from the ability of somebody that I appoint, which is my granddaughter, to continue uh, distributing my material. Are you and your granddaughter planning on opening your own web store? No, I'm not planning on, on opening it, but I have given all my rights and you know, all my material and everything to my granddaughter, Jacquinette. And since I've been given all the material and the rights to the Amazon, uh, it is something that I'm definitely considering down the road. At this time, I'm still working on putting together a few missing pieces to her collection. Um, Grandma's had a uh, quite a number of, of long-term fans and friends that have been so kind as to reach out to me and offer to help me with this project, and, and I really do appreciate um, their patronage and their dedication to helping me put back together this collection so that I can keep Grandma's story alive. Um, just the way that life is right now, I just don't see that being an option, but down the road that is something that I am certainly considering, and um, I am more than happy for the possibility of sharing that and, and keeping her story alive, and I'm very open to fans reaching out to me via email or through um, the Mixed Wrestling Forum website, which I'm sure will be provided at the end of this interview. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. It doesn't hurt to ask. Is there any advice that you would give to people just starting out as video producers? Yes, definitely. Copyright your material. That's probably the biggest thing. And uh, make sure you get release signatures. Uh, you can go to the um, um, stationery store and pick up perfectly good releases. You might want to change them a little bit and then recopy them yourself. But uh, look them over and, and pick out the best releases so that you have it, all of your competitive uh, people signed and released to you. And any, any other advice? Um, Maybe about uh, regarding uh, business deals with um, distributors or things like that? Oh, um, yes. Don't do it on a handshake. Do it on paper. I uh, have uh, uh, somebody um, a witness the paper signing. Make sure, make sure you have a release from all of your competitors for each match that they, that they have for you. Um, and why is it important to have them sign a release for every match that they do? Why, would, why wouldn't it be sufficient just to use the original release form? Uh, well, you have to have every match or, or they can, you know, bring it against you in any way, shape, or form, you know, and they can actually, uh, you know, say, hey, that money is owed to me because I was competing and I, they can say they didn't... Uh, Sign for sign a release, and you know you have to be careful. So essentially, you're just covering your own. Yeah, you're covering your own ass. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to meet young Jadell, who has just decided to venture into the world of female submission wrestling and video production, what would you tell her? Would you tell her that you are proud of what she has been able to achieve, or is there anything that you would warn her about? Well, I definitely tell her I'd be, that I was proud of it, and. Um, I would warn her about not training enough. You have to train. You have to have endurance. You have to run. Uh, you don't have to be a speed runner or something, but you have to put your your leg up and down a lot, <laughs> as fast as you can comfortably go, and build that endurance. Be able to breathe that air. 
because I had matches that ran way over an hour. And, you know, thank heavens I had put in all those miles. And my opponent, uh, chances are she was just pretty close to being as stubborn as I was, so that was what made it difficult to defeat her. And uh, you feel good when, when you train. You feel good when you have your matches. And never give there any space to have an excuse to lose a match. Is there anything else that you would you would warn her about? Um, maybe more so on the side of the publicity or the fame and the fortune. Have a good partner. You need somebody who cares about you enough to support you and who's smart enough to send you in the right direction as far as publicity goes. And I will have to, to give my ex-husband the, the credit for knowing and catching on and uh, doing all those things right. Otherwise, I don't think any of you out there would know who I was. And finally, is there a message that you would like to send to your fans today? Oh, well, a big thank you for <laughs> the, my fans sounds a little bit uh, weird, but I really appreciate the following that I had and the, the things that uh, I would hear from them. And that I miss. I miss that as much as I miss wrestling. So it, it put women's sports, I think, in a, in a good light. And it was always a positive thing for me. So thank you. <laughs> and, and Grandma, I can, I can speak to the fact that I continually um, am reminded of how much of a following you have out there, especially with the Internet these days. Um, it, it hasn't stopped. I don't think it's even slowed down as far mm -hmm. as the following that you have and the, the dedication that your fans have. I find that when I'm trying to put the pieces together of your of your collection and and fully understand your your journey from start to finish that your fans are the best resource that I have out there and that they know probably more than you know you remember or that <laughs> I know and and they've always treated me with 100% respect and and I've noticed that I've never found anything um badly said about you um out on the internet and and I that, to me, means a lot, um, not only being your granddaughter, but seeing you as, a, as an icon or as, a, as an athlete. Um, actions speak louder than words, and, and that, that just, it really makes me look up to you, that you know, people follow you in such ways, and, and in good ways, and, and say such positive things about you. Well, thank you for saying that. It's... And, Grandma, as you know, um, Zweig was not able to fly over here and, and conduct the interview with you in person, which I'm sure he would have been honored to do and, and, and would have jumped at the opportunity if it would have allowed. So we decided that I would do the interview with you and um, pass it on to him to share with the world. Um, but he did want me to tell you on behalf of himself and all the fan, fans at Male vs. Female uh, Forum that they thank you very much for this interview. Um, that you know, fans from all over the world are are thankful for you and what you've given so generously uh, to women's wrestling through the decades. Um, they love you very much, and they wish you good health and a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>